And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Seattle, take three. It was a pleasant sensation Ted Cordray was experiencing, staring down at the big pile of money on the bed cover, his eyes lingering over the hundreds of small bills a moment before he would shove them into this half-packed suitcase. Yes, a pleasant sensation, because the job was done, and soon Ted would be on his way out of Los Angeles without a worry in the world, probably forever. A strange contrast, all that money and the shabby hotel room that Ted Cordray had been forced to take until his departure. But that sort of thing could be over forever, too, Ted was thinking. And then, quickly, Ted shoved the money under some clothing in his suitcase. And after the case shut, he crossed slowly to the door. Come on, Ted, open up. I know you're in there. Andy? Yeah, it's me, Teddy boy. Surprised? No. Oh. Not to see an old friend. What do you want, Andy? <laughs> well? Why don't you close the door, Teddy boy? Grab it. And somebody might be passing by. Yeah, so what's that to me? Okay, I'll close it for you. Got anything to drink around? Uh, no, no, this is kind of a temporary setup, Andy. You see, I... <laughs> what's a laugh for? What's so funny, anyway? You, you're funny. Trying to play so innocent around little Andy. It won't work, Teddy boy. I know what's cooking. And what is cooking? Hmm, about 30 G's. They're hot enough to cook anyway. Oh? Uh -huh. Still not going to drop it, huh? Okay. It's money Gus Stillman collected from the $2 bookies and gave you to distribute to the boys. Only they didn't know he gave it to you, and poor old Gus got himself run over by a car. So? So? So, Teddy Boy and, uh, me, his good friend Andy, <laughs> we got ourselves some dough, huh? A shakedown, huh? It's not like you, Andy, not like you at all. Oh, I'm getting tired, Ted, real tired. I won't even have an argue with you if it ain't half. Give me a third and I'll be on my way. You think you will, huh? For how long, Andy? Oh, now, Teddy Boy, I said I'm tired. I won't chase after you. No, I know you won't. That's a boy. Because you won't know where to chase. The only thing you won't do is tell the boys, because that cuts you out entirely. And because you know what they'd do if they found out you'd waited until after I left town to tell them. Now, now look, Ted, I... No, you look, Andy. Right this way. I'll get a cleaner shot at your jaw. It won't hurt so much. And Andy... Yeah, yeah. You said you're tired. This will give you some rest. One blow does it, doesn't it, Ted? Andy sinks slowly, passes out on the floor of your hotel room. There's only one worry. He'll be covering every bus and railroad station in town in an hour or so. You tie him up securely, put a handkerchief over his mouth. Decide this will keep him quiet long enough for you to catch a plane. You grab your suitcase, step out of the room, and lock the door. Downstairs, you pay your bill, step into a phone booth, and call the airline. I want passage for one, please. The next plane to San Francisco. Mm, yes, sir. We can accommodate you. Uh, that will be flight six, eleven tonight. Eleven? 
Well, that's three hours. Haven't you anything else? Sorry, sir. If you would called earlier... No, skip it. I'll try another line. You don't like to stay too long on the phone, do you, Ted? Not with Andy unconscious just upstairs. But you take time to call two more airlines with the same results. No space or a later departure. You're wondering what to do when you hear an odd tapping on the glass door of the phone booth. You turn, almost freeze to the spot at the sight of a girl who's staring in at you, smiling amusingly. Well, hello, Betty. Hello, Ted. Get your party? Uh, no, no, they're, they're calling me back. You never call me anymore. Oh, now, look. Please, Ted. I wish we could talk things over. I made a mistake. It's you I want. Great. Tell that to your husband. Please, Ted. Let me talk. I'm in a hurry. I got things to do. I got a lot. Hey, how'd you know I was staying here? All right, I'll admit it. I followed you. Saw you on the street the other day and followed you. A little puppy dog. Uh-huh. You sure that's it? You weren't talking to Andy? Andy Clark? I haven't seen him for months. Oh. Come on. Talk to a guy, will you? Am I scare up enough for a drink? Look, I have to make this one call. It's important. Then I want to get out of this place. It gives me the creeps. I'll wait for you. Okay. Only wait around the corner. There's a little bar there. It's kind of nice. I'll be right over, Betty. Sure? Sure. Funny. I believe you. Make it fast, huh? Yeah, ten minutes. I'll be sitting right here reading the paper until this phone rings. You pick up a paper, Ted. Make it look good as Betty smiles and walks toward the hotel exit. You're about to leave when your eyes fasten on something in the paper you're holding. A little item in the classified section. Driving Seattle Monday a.m. Can take three. Share expenses. Call Midland 9789. Mr. Bemis. There it is, Ted, your answer. You circle it with a pencil. It's your way out of town no matter who might be watching Andy or any of the boys he referred to. They'd never expect you to travel this way. It's so simple, Ted. Andy can check every depot in town. Nine, seven, eight, nine. Hello? Uh, Mr. Bemis? Buell Bemis, that's right. What can I do for you? Well, uh, my name is Cordray. I saw your ad in this morning's oh, paper. yes, 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 Mr. Cordray. Like to make the trip with me? Nice, comfortable car. Yeah, how many are you taking? Well, now, to be perfectly honest, and I expected of people myself, no one, just no one's phoned me yet. First time I ever tried this sort of thing, thought I would to save something, but... Uh, look, Bemis, I like it better that way. Oh? Yeah, I'll go the whole thing, whatever it costs. Uh, how soon can we get away? Uh, well, sir, you... By surprise. Uh, let me see now. Uh, no use starting right out. Night driving's bad, you know. Uh, how about 5.30 in the morning? I'll pick you up. Uh, never mind. I'll meet you. Uh, where are you staying? Why, it's no trouble. Uh, I... Where are you, I said? The Midtown Hotel. The Midtown. Good enough. I I'll be there 5.30. Very good, Mr. Cordray. The Midtown, Ted, at 5.30. And you'll be on your way out of town. You wish you could share the luxury of Mr. Bemis' address tonight, but you can't. You've got to hide out, Ted, from Andy and anyone else who might be interested. And, of course, from your old girlfriend, Betty, you can't risk seeing her. A motel on the outskirts of the city solves the problem, doesn't it? And the next morning, promptly at 5.30, you're waiting in the chill air outside the midtown as a big car pulls up near the curb. Hello there! You looking for Buell Bemis? Yes, Mr. Bemis. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Here, I'll put your bag in back. Hey, if you don't mind, I'll take oh, care. Oh, uh, suit yourself, Miss Cordray. Get right in. Uh, what's your first name? Uh, Ted. Uh, from now on, I'll make it Ted. Save time. You call me Buell, huh? All right. Uh, Buell. Uh, let's go, huh? We're on our way. <laughs> How do you like this boat? Beats walking, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it's a nice car. Now, what route are we taking, Mr. Bemis? Make it Buell, please. I think 101 is best. More divided highway. Well, I think there's a quicker way to get on 101 if you'll turn up the... Oh, st oh, forgot to tell you. I'm saving you money. Yes, sir. A nice little couple are joining us. 
called shortly after well, you. Look, did. I told you. Oh, that... I know very decent of you, too. But since they called and the car's so big, so roomy, anyway, uh, <laughs> picking them up in Glendale. Well, that's kind of out of the way. Now, don't worry. I'll get us there, Ted. <laughs> I know a shortcut. Been using it for years. Yeah. <laughs> like the fella says, you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. You aren't pleased, are you, Ted? But there's little you can do about the young couple Buell Bemis is picking up. Or about Buell Bemis himself. You hadn't bargained on such a constant conversation. And in Glendale, waiting outside a little duplex, as Bemis goes inside after the couple, you're tempted to start the big car and run off with it. You decide against it. Men have cause to regret the decision. The couple with Bemis, Ted. You've never seen the man, but the girl. It's Betty, isn't it? Getting right into the car with you. Oh, Mr. Cordray, meet uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. Bob and Betty, huh? And this is Ted, folks. How do you do? Hi. Ted, that's a nice name. I knew a Ted once. Ever mention him to you, darling? Uh, no, no, I don't think you did. Well, I should have. Oh, I think this is going to be fun. Mr. Cordray, uh, Ted, how did you happen to find out about Mr. Bemis? Uh, make that Buell, my dear. I uh, ran across his ad in the newspaper. Really? Isn't that funny? I just happened to pick up a newspaper, too, outside a phone booth. Mr. Bemis. Uh, Buell. <laughs> <laughs> Buell's ad had been circled. Mm, uh, somebody who didn't call, huh? I suppose. Uh, too bad. There's so much room here. More the merrier. Well... All set, folks? I'm fine. Bob? I'm all right. Good. And you, Ted? All set and all acquainted, huh? <laughs> I think it saves conversation. Yeah, let's save a little right now, Buell. Get this thing rolling. Huh? Oh, a kidder. <laughs> That's good. This trip will be dandy. Real peachy dandy. And, folks? Yes? We're off. <laughs> Off to see the wizard! <laughs> yeah, that little ad of mine was a good idea. A very, very good idea. Yeah, just great. After last Sunday's broadcast, a Whistler fan came up to me and asked, Marvin, how can you keep on thinking up new things to say week after week about Signal Ethel? Well, friends, keeping enthusiastic about the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline is no problem at all. All I do is drive into the nearest Signal station and fill up with Signal Ethel. Then I step on the gas. When I see how my car steps out ahead in city traffic, I know what I'm going to say about Signal Ethel's get-up-and-go. When I point my car up some steep hill and see how Signal Ethel keeps me in high right over the top, I know what I'm going to say about Signal Ethel's power. I just say the same things you'll be saying once you try this great gasoline that's scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. In fact, once you treat your car to a tank full of this super powerful super fuel, I can just hear you saying, Marvin Miller was sure right about Signal Ethel. It was a shock, wasn't it, Ted? Your perfect plan for slipping out of town backfired. Yes. When your former girlfriend, now Betty Wilson, stepped into the car in which you thought you'd be driving alone with Mr. Buell Bemis. You realize now what a fool you were to leave your newspaper with the ad circled in it. You should have known Betty would have come back looking for you when you didn't keep your date with her. And you begin to realize you were stupid to have used your real name with Bemis. Slipped out before you thought of it. Those mistakes are behind you now, Ted. And Betty's sitting only a few feet from you in the big Great car, the country, listening yes. along with you and her husband to the rambling, well, well, ceaseless right talk now. supplied well, by the driver now. and owner, Mr. <laughs> Buell Bemis. <laughs> but you'll see. Nice little valleys, beautiful hills, even see the ocean every now and then. But do you suppose we'll see a coffee shop, Buell? I could stand some. Oh, no, 
just the spot. Castell. That's where I'm swinging back over to pick up 101. Yeah. <laughs> you were Glendale folks. Took me a little out of the way. Sorry. No, no, perfectly all right. Worry Ted here, though. Really? You skip it. Let's not wait till Castaic Bemis. The joint up ahead's fine. Ooh, all right. But don't get sore. <laughs> don't get sore. He does stop, doesn't he, Ted? After you'd almost given up hope. Betty excuses herself while her husband, Bemis, and you enter the coffee shop. Later, after your coffee, when Bemis returns to the car, you manage a few moments alone with her as she waits for her husband to return from a drugstore half a block away. Surprised, weren't you? Frankly, yes. How'd you know I'd be in that car? Because you're a heel. I mean, specifically, how did you know? Specifically, you're a heel. Well, I came back into the hotel and listened outside the phone booth. The wall's like paper. You heard every word. Practically. The newspaper told me the rest. So where do we go from here? Seattle, I believe the ad said. Uh, Your husband, does he jump whenever you give the order? Sometimes. This was one. He isn't too well. Out of work. I said there was a job for me in Seattle. Nightclub. Wouldn't let me go alone, that's all. That's pretty slick. And uh, when there's no job? There'll be no better either. Going with Ted. Isn't that right? Yeah, I guess so. All right, I've got no objection. Have you uh, given any thought to uh, what we'll use for money? No. Have you? I'm broke, Betty. You always manage. Satisfied to take that kind of a chance, huh? Have you? Yes. Okay. You seem to be calling the plays. Uh, there's your husband getting into the car. Come on, let's get started. You're not too worried, are you, Ted? With Betty's husband along, watching her, worrying about her. You'll be able to get away, perhaps in San Francisco. Meanwhile, you can keep her assured that everything's all right. But back in the car and on the road, everything doesn't go all right. Betty's husband... You happen to turn around just in time to see him pitch forward slightly, clutching at his stomach. Oh, Bob, what is it? I, I don't know. My, my stomach is sharp. Probably those donuts back there. I told you we should have waited till we got to Castaic. There's a spot there. Yeah, but he's in bad shape. This happened before. He isn't well. Mr. Uh, uh, Pierce, you've got to find him a doctor. But, uh, you heard her. Find a doctor. Turn around. Somebody back there can tell us where to go. Well, all right, whatever you say. Sometime later, you're sitting in the waiting room of a small hospital just off the main highway. Bemis nervously pacing the floor, stopping occasionally to glance at the wall clock over your head. Oh, dear, dear, dear. wonder how much longer we'll be here. What's your hurry? Well, it'll be getting dark before too long, and I just don't like to drive at night, my boy. Relax, we can stop over somewhere along the road. Oh, Mrs. Wilson, how is he? Doctor says Bob is too sick to go on. Oh, that is a shame. Yeah, that's... Too bad, Betty. Yes. Isn't it? Well, that's that, I suppose. You'll be staying here, of course. Of course, Mr. Bean. In that case, we might as well be on our way, Buell. Oh, yes, yes. I'd have to turn out this way, Mrs. Wilson. Uh, Betty, certainly enjoyed your company, didn't we, my boy? Yeah, I really hate to say goodbye, Betty. But we must, Ted. We've got a lot of road ahead of us, a lot of road. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Mr. Bean. Come along, my boy. Ted. Yeah. You're really going? I got business up north. Can't wait. I can't leave, Bob. Not now, not like this. That's right. You can't leave him. Coming, Ted. Hey, you're coming. So long, sweetheart. See you around. Back in the car, speeding north. You lean back in your seat, pleased with the way things have turned out. Yes, you're rid of Betty now, aren't you, Ted? Once and for all. You're certain of that. And it's a big load off your mind. Finally, with the coming of darkness, Bemis drives into a motel. After a few drinks at the bar, dinner, you retire to the privacy of your own room. And open your suitcase. The money. Where's the... It's gone. The money's gone. Betty. When we stopped for coffee, she went back to the car. That's where... She took it. Famous! Famous! 
Let's open up. Yeah. What is the matter? Get your stuff, Bemis. We're leaving. Leaving? I was just about to... Get your stuff. We're going back. See here, my boy. What are you talking about? Going back where? To the hospital where we left the Wilsons. The hospital? Oh, that's miles back. Why? Why? Never mind the questions. Get dressed. Now, see here, Ted. I don't think I care to drive all the way back there. Not at this time of night. This gun says we're going back. Oh, no, 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 my boy. Don't get get excited. I'll I'll do whatever you say. Only only put that gun away. Now, please. Get moving. Pardon me, miss. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Uh, you uh, have a patient here, uh, Mr. Wilson. Came in this afternoon. Mr. Wilson? Oh. Oh, yes. You're a, a friend of his? Uh, yeah. I, I was wondering if Mrs. Wilson... I'm would... sorry, sir. Mr. Wilson died on the operating table two hours ago. He died? Yes. Hmm. I see. Uh... Is Mrs. Wilson still here? No, she left some time ago with Dr. Mason. I believe he was going to drive her to the bus stop. The bus stop? Down at the end of the street. She said something about going back to Los Angeles to inform relatives. Uh, Thanks. It's almost one o'clock in the morning before you catch sight of the southbound bus. Parked off the highway in front of an all-night cafe. As you order Bemis to stop the car, you glance inside the cafe and see Betty sitting at the counter. It's not too late, Ted. And this time, you're really glad to see Betty. Okay, Bemis. Thanks for everything. You you mean I can go now? Yeah, that's right. I won't need you anymore. Go on, get lost. Believe me, this is the last time I'll advertise for passengers. I was saying, a guy on the road like me gets to know all the angles. See, all the Excuse angles... Excuse me, please. Hmm? Ted. Ted. Oh, Betty. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, no, of course not. Uh, Mr. Cordray, this is Mr. Sims. Uh, how do you do? All right. As a matter of fact, Mr. Sims here was just about to get back on the bus. Huh? Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yes, sir. Here, um, have my chair, young fella. Uh, thanks. Uh, see you folks later, huh? You got my check, sweetheart? Uh, bus line, Casanova? He's been pestering me ever since I got on the bus. Wouldn't let me out of his sight. Uh-huh. Too bad about your husband, wasn't it? How did you know? I went back to the hospital. Hmm. Why did you, Ted? Well, I got to thinking it over. How about you? Came back? Because of me? You know darn well I did. What did you think I'd do? Ted, what's the matter? Well, believe me, I didn't expect you to come back oh, for me. Oh, that's good, baby, because you're not what I came back for. Ted, what... I'll give you a big clue. You got something that appeals to me very much. My money. Money? Oh, no, Ted. How I... come you didn't leave your suitcase on the bus? I wanted to freshen up a little while we were waiting. Yeah, I'll bet. Come on, baby. You and I are going to take a little walk. There's a nice little country road right across the highway. It won't take long. It'll be all over before you know it. Probably the question drivers ask each other most often is, how much oil do you have to add between grains? That's practically the same as asking, how much engine wear do you have? Yes, when oil consumption begins to climb, engine wear is usually one of the principal causes. That's why Signal's new premium motor oil, which reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%, is such good news for drivers. Just think of it. New Signal premium, by reducing engine wear 50% every mile you drive, should double the number of miles you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption if your car isn't already an oil eater, should double the number of miles you can drive before your motor needs an overhaul due to engine wear, should double the number of miles your car will keep its like-new pep and power. 
Yet all this extra protection of Signal's new heavy-duty type motor oil is yours at no increase in price. If you'll just remember one thing, get your next oil change at a Signal service station. Where? At a Signal station. You were right, weren't you, Ted? It was all over before Betty Wilson knew it. You killed her without a sound. Quickly opened her purse. The money wasn't there. You discarded it. Then pick up her traveling bag you're certain contains the $30,000 that was stolen from your suitcase. And hurry back toward the highway. Once there, you decide it's safer to forego the bus and thumb arrive. This time, you don't want any complications, do you, Ted? No Betty, no Mr. Bemis, no one but you. You wait until the bus leaves. Then as you start walking rapidly down the highway, a voice calls on you to halt. The sheriff, isn't it, Ted? You wonder what could have gone wrong. How he could have spotted you so quickly. Especially how he could know your name. But once in his office, it doesn't take you long to find out. Look, Cordray, we know you killed her. We've got witnesses. Charlie Sims, one of the passengers on the bus. That's what he says. He probably did it himself. She told me he'd been annoying her. That won't do, Cordray. Sims followed you and the girl from the cafe down the road. He saw you kill her. Turned back and phoned me. If I hadn't lived close by, you'd have gotten away. Oh, why, why would I kill her? She was just an old friend I bumped into. That's what we want to know. Why? We know you killed her, but we don't know why. And your suitcase will tell us. Uh, get that phone, will you, Slade, while I go through the girl's suitcase? Right, Sheriff. Sheriff's office. Slade speaking. Uh, beats me, Cordray. Nothing here but clothes. Makeup. What? That's right. Well, it can't be. There's 30,000. Are you sure? Oh, so that's why you killed her. Money, huh? Okay, I'll tell her. What was it, Slade? That guy got himself killed in a car crash. The guy we're on the lookout for, named uh, Bemis. Wanted by the L.A. police. Bemis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was running a pretty slick racket. Advertising in the newspapers for passing. People to share costs of motor trips. And then he'd rob them. Sure made himself a haul on this trip. Had over 30 grand in his pockets when they found him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. When you take a chance to save a moment, you take a chance on that moment being your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, High Averback, Gene Tatum, Herb Butterfield, Nancy Cleveland, Don DeLeo, and Peter Leeds. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for The Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.